This is CBN News Watch. And thank you so much for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Matt from Graham. We're going to begin this half hour in the Middle East. Israel is anticipating a potential major retaliation by Iran after one of its top generals was killed in a strike earlier this week. But as Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, Israel is also dealing with a major change in U.S. policy after a phone call between President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. That happened on Thursday. Israel moved to get more aid into Gaza by opening up a key port and a crossing into northern Gaza. This comes after President Biden told Prime Minister Netanyahu that U.S. policy toward Israel will change unless the Israeli military does more to protect aid workers and deals with the humanitarian situation in Gaza. With respect to Gaza, uh, we need to see certain changes. Uh, uh, and if we don't, then we'll have to consider changes to our own policy. But it's not about... It's not about leverage. Biden also told Netanyahu he wants a ceasefire deal without delay. He underscored as well that an immediate ceasefire is essential to stabilize and improve the humanitarian situation and protect innocent civilians. And he urged Prime Minister Netanyahu to empower his negotiators to conclude a deal without delay. But there are still big differences between Israel and Hamas, as Hamas wants the war to end immediately with a complete Israeli pullout from Gaza. So some argue a ceasefire could mean losing the war. Jeff Balaban, who leads the American Center for Law and Justice's Israel operations from Jerusalem, told CBN News a ceasefire would have dire consequences for Israel. The implications for that is that America has now completely become Israel's tactical enemy. In, in, in real terms, in practical terms, this is impossible. That is demanding that Israel lose this war. Israel cannot afford to lose this war. This is an existential war. Netanyahu also maintains Israel must win its war against terrorist forces for the sake of the U.S. and the rest of the West. This is a larger battle. Our battle is your battle. Our victory is your victory. And if, they, if we don't have a victory, this will have enormous implications for American security, for our common uh, future. So we must win. In his call with Netanyahu, Biden expressed outrage over Israel's accidentally killing of seven aid workers in Gaza on Monday. But American conservatives point out the U.S. also killed civilians with the drone strike during Biden's chaotic pullout from Afghanistan in 2021. I am now convinced that as many as 10 civilians, including up to seven children, were tragically killed in that strike. Meanwhile, Blinken is taking heat for suggesting Israel could become like Hamas if it doesn't do more to reverence life in Gaza. That's our strength. It's what distinguishes us from terrorists like Hamas. If we lose that reverence for human life, we risk becoming indistinguishable from those we confront. The latest disagreement between the White House and Israel comes as Israelis from all political viewpoints increasingly believe their country stands alone in the world. Yet despite their political divisions, Israelis agree Hamas must be destroyed. Balaban says many in Israel are turning to God. They feel 100 percent resolute. There is, of course, a large, we've seen this since the beginning of the war, turning to God. We see people who say things like, I'm not sure I'm a believer, or I've never been a believer, but I'm keeping Shabbat. Or I'm not sure I'm a believer, but I'm going to say the Shema prayer, or I'm going to wear tzitzit, because that's what unifies the Jewish people. Chris joins us now with more. So, Chris, President Biden told Benjamin Netanyahu U.S. policy with Israel would change unless there is more protections for aid workers. What are some implications that could affect Israel right away if the policies don't change? Well, Ephraim, the first thing that could change would be diplomatic support. We saw some of that diplomatic support eroding uh, just a few days ago no, when the, at the United change. Nations Security Council, the United States, abstained in a key Security Council resolution. Uh, ammunition for the war. Uh, there has been talk about maybe delaying or, or restricting uh, ammunition for Israel when in its war with Hamas and a possible future war with Hezbollah. And also, perhaps, increased support for the political opposition here 
uh, in Israel against the Netanyahu government. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of people who have been saying the White House is actually supporting the political opposition of, uh, of Bibi Netanyahu, and, uh, and so that could increase as well. These are all possible implications uh, of, of any uh, change in policy by the U.S. against Israel. You reported some believe a ceasefire could mean losing the war. What are some of the uh, biggest arguments to this belief? Well, right now, Hamas has about four battalions left in Rafah out of about 24 uh, battalions that have been degraded or destroyed by the IDF. But the concern is if they survive, they could reconstitute uh, inside Gaza. Uh, and if they survive, even if they're greatly degraded, uh, they can claim victory. They did that in 2021 when they really took a severe blow, uh, but then they, they emerged and declared victory. Uh, and Ephraim, it also sends a signal to Israel's enemies in the region. Uh, Hezbollah, but especially Iran, is watching all of this, and it can embolden them if uh, Israel doesn't win and have a clear victory. As uh, Jeff Balaban said, Israelis see this as an existential Existential war, uh, far more than just Hamas. If you look at the greater region, you see Iran's trying to put a noose around the neck of Israel with all its proxies in the region, region from the Houthis down in Yemen to Hezbollah up in Lebanon. Well, we know that there are still hostages being held captive. Where do we stand right now with talks for their release? Well, Ephraim, really, we haven't been seeing many, uh, any progress for, for weeks now, and Hamas is taking a harder position. Uh, some believe that the White House is actually uh, increasing that, uh, that hard position by, by coming against uh, Israel. Uh, Hamas wants a permanent ceasefire. They want to pull out of all Israeli troops uh, from the Gaza Strip, and those are both non-starters for Israel. Uh, it, you know, they, they, after October 7th, uh, Israelis and the Israeli government really see that they need to win this war. And so, really, that puts uh, the hostage, uh, the remaining hostages, 134 in, uh, in Gaza, and especially their families, uh, very, very in, in anguish right, right now. Well, that's why prayer is so important for the hostages and their families. Indeed it is. We continue to pray even as we speak. What can we expect this evening on Jerusalem Dateline, Chris? Well, we're going to have an update uh, as well and more analysis with Jeb Balaman. Uh, also analysis from Alex Trayman. He's the Jerusalem bureau chief for the Jerusalem, uh, the Jewish News Syndicate, about the Biden administration and their interference in Israeli politics. Uh, Julie Stahl has a story on U.S. farmers coming here to Israel to help Israeli farmers. It's a really, uh, really special story. It's also prophetic uh, the, where, where some of the uh, people from the nations are coming to help uh, Israel. Also have a story from CBN Israel helping immigrants make the move here to Israel. So all of those will be there on uh, Jerusalem Dateline starting tonight. All right. Thank you, Chris. Looking forward to that, Chris Mitchell. We appreciate your insight. Encourage you to stay safe, and we continue to pray for you, our staff, and the entire team there in Israel. I want to remind you, you can see the latest from Jerusalem Dateline tonight on the CBN News Channel. It begins at 8 Eastern. You can also watch it on the CBN News app, or you can watch it on YouTube. Now here at home, astronomers, scientists, and much of America have Monday, April 8th, circled on the calendar. And that is when a total solar eclipse is expected to pass over parts of the U.S. from southern Texas to the east coast of Maine. CBN's Paul Pedit shows us how people are preparing for the event and how eclipses were interpreted during biblical times. I am excited. I am. It can be a spectacle like no other. We're all in. Yeah, should be a great day. And right now, it's all the buzz. We're going to make a day of it. Maybe the weekend. Eclipse mania is sweeping the nation. It's pretty dramatic. Uh, a total solar eclipse is a very uh, unique event because the moon, by a strange coincidence, happens to be exactly the same apparent size in our sky as the sun. Of course, the moon's much smaller than the sun, but it's also a lot closer, and it's just at precisely the right distance that it blocks out the sun while leaving the area immediately around the sun, which means that we get to see the solar atmosphere called the corona. Five major U.S. cities will be in the path of totality. That's the 115-mile-wide track falling under the moon's central shadow. Not only, of course, does it get dark because the body of the sun is no longer visible uh, and even noticeably colder, but we have this remarkable display. And uh, it's often said that animals like birds will be fooled into thinking that night has fallen quite quickly. 
The roughly four-minute spectacle has had some state leaders preparing for months. We're expecting about a million extra people from that Thursday night, the 4th, through uh, Tuesday, the 9th. As a result, many schools in Arkansas and other states are canceling classes. Texas officials are even warning residents to top off their gas tank and stock up on food. In Ohio, the governor signed an executive order to increase staffing for emergency management. They're all treating the April late eclipse like a major travel holiday. Any way you cut it, the interstates and highways are going to be crowded. More than 31 million people will be in the path of totality when the eclipse passes over North America. As exciting as it is for us today, eclipses took on a much different tone in ancient times. The ancient people saw celestial phenomenon as omens. Using a dating system that intersects NASA data with the ancient Assyrian calendar, associates for Bible research say it shows an eclipse passed over Nineveh in mid-8th century B.C. That event was preceded and followed by a series of natural disasters. And lo and behold, what does the Bible show us? Immediately after this, a renegade prophet named Jonah shows up, and he's preaching repentance at a time when they would be open to it that normally they wouldn't because of the omen. Stripling says the same dating method shows a celestial spectacle happening in 33 AD on April the 3rd. Approximately the same time, the Gospels record the earth turning dark the day of Jesus' crucifixion. Picture this. As the stone is, is rolling to, to seal the tomb, on the horizon, the moon is beginning to appear. And guess what? It's a lunar eclipse. Listen. Ancient people would have, would have been powerfully impacted by this. However you feel the impact from this event, countless people worldwide will have an eye to the sky April 8 to see something that has been drawing awe since time began. I've got to get some glasses. I don't know where to get them. Paul Petit, CBN News. Coming up, targeted terror. Iran has sent thousands of drones to Russia and Vladimir Putin has launched them into Ukraine, killing innocent civilians. We're going to bring you that story when we come back. Stay with us. Welcome back to CBN News Watch. President Vladimir Putin is relying on outside help to wage his war against Ukraine. Iran has sent thousands of drones to attack civilians and critical infrastructure. CBN's George Thomas traveled to Odessa, where these lethal weapons are devastating the lives of innocent people. Midnight, March 2nd, in Odessa. Anna and Timothy were in our bedroom. I was in the other room with our daughter Lisa. I usually go to her room to try and help her fall asleep. I fell asleep too with her that night. An hour later, Russia launched eight kamikaze drones from Crimea, targeting the Ukrainian port city. At about 1.17 a.m., I heard a sound, a sharp sound, like a drone, and then a sharp explosion. While Ukrainian air defenses intercepted seven drones, the eighth struck Anna and Sergei's nine-story apartment. Everything was on fire. I woke up quickly and got up, took my daughter in my arms and wrapped her in a blanket. I ran out of the room to make sure that my wife and son were safe. I saw that the door to our bedroom was open, and suddenly I noticed that the bedroom was gone. There was just an abyss and a mountain of garbage below. Search and rescue teams arrived within minutes of the attack. I was in shock. What kind of scary dream was that? Maybe it was a dream, I thought, but it was real. After 12 hours, firefighters found Anna and their four-month-old Timothy in the basement of the apartment. The structures of the seven floors came down on them, pinning them down completely. During the explosion, the bed flipped over and the mattress and blanket covered them. It's a good thing that happened. Their bodies survived. They weren't blown apart. That was important to me. The forensics later found out that they died in their sleep next to each other. It was an Iranian drone known as the Shahid 136 that brought down Anna and Sergei's home. Earlier this month, hundreds of emails and thousands of internal documents 
revealed that since the war here in Ukraine began more than two years ago, Russia has purchased more than 6,000 Iranian drones. Military specialists told me that the Shahed drone was programmed from start to finish, from the point of takeoff to the point of impact. It was programmed to fly right here. A total of 12 people were killed in our apartment. This is targeted terror. According to Ukraine's Air Force, Russia has launched almost 3,800 Shahed drones over the last two years, attacking civilian targets and infrastructure like power plants. The Russian army purposefully killed my wife and my little baby. Iran is to blame too. Those who take the weapons and kill are to blame. And those who sell those weapons are also to blame. In February, hackers obtained thousands of internal documents from a company reportedly linked to Iran's defense ministry that revealed extensive technical help Tehran is providing Moscow to manufacture these Shahed drones. The Washington Post uncovered an industrial hub last August, hundreds of miles east of Moscow, where thousands of drones have been assembled. A few days ago, Russian media showed video from reportedly inside that plant with dozens of Shahed drones on display. Ukraine intelligence believes Hezbollah and members of Iran's Revolutionary Guard are also teaching Russians how to operate the drones. Anishka. Anna was a sunshine person for all of us. She enjoyed life. She loved the world. She loved God. CBN News was there last week as hundreds of Christians came to this church in Odessa to pay their last respects to Anna and Timofey. Anna's father is a well-known pastor in the city. God gave us life and we rejoiced in it. We praised God, we served in church. She was very active in the church's ministry. Ukraine's President Zelensky also laid flowers near their destroyed apartment building and mentioned the sadness he felt of Timofey's passing in a tweet. First of all, I have no anger towards the Russians. There is no aggression and no desire for revenge. Second, I have no anger towards God. I don't have any questions. Of course, humanly speaking, it is very hard to accept this. But God, almost on this day of the funeral, when we were waiting for a miracle, He sent peace into my heart. George Thomas, CBN News, Odessa, Ukraine. Still ahead, we'll take a look at the controversy over transgender medicine and minors. Stay with us. You're watching CBN Newswatch. Welcome back to CBN Newswatch. Here in America, states are battling over the issue of restricting gender transition medicine and procedures for children. Now from the United Kingdom comes a major decision. The National Health Service will no longer prescribe puberty-blocking drugs for children. CBN Charlene Aaron reports on the impact it could have here in the United States. A decision banning puberty blockers for children followed an independent review, citing safety concerns and limited research on long-term effects. The National Health Service concluded there is not enough evidence to support the safety or clinical effectiveness of puberty suppressing hormones to make the treatment routinely available at this time. Former UK Prime Minister Liz Truss applauding the ban. I'm delighted that the health service is now saying that no under 18s can be prescribed these drugs. Here in the U.S., a recent study shows nearly 20 percent of all people identifying as transgender are aged 13 to 17. That's close to 300,000. The number of kids known to be on puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones has more than doubled in four years, from close to 2,400 in 2017 to more than 5,000 in 2021. Sarah Partial Perry of the Heritage Foundation blames gender ideology for fueling the rise. We're seeing this increase because young people are vulnerable to the impacts of peer pressure, social media, cultural elites, and again, what they are hearing from their commander in chief and the individuals in positions of power in this country. Effects are linked to poor mental health among children struggling with gender confusion. Research also found that 34 percent of trans youth have experienced a decline in mental health while taking the drugs. 
Physicians say major concerns include risk of sterility, lifelong dependence on medication, and anguish of regret. Nathaniel Blake of the Ethics and Public Policy Center. So they are experimenting on children with no real understanding of what they're doing. With regard to sterility, that is a real problem, and that is inevitable for some of these treatment pathways. More than 20 Republican-led states have adopted laws restricting medical intervention for children with gender dysphoria. We've seen many of these bans enacted at the state level, 23 bans for procedures, cross-sex hormones, and puberty blockers for minors under the age of 18. And I hope now is that this will encourage more states to pass bans for these procedures under the age of 18 in their states. Back in Europe, more countries such as Norway, Finland, and Sweden are following the UK's lead. And Blake is hoping that trend soon includes the U.S. I think it will happen. I don't think that it will be quite the same as in the U.K., but I think all it may take will be one or two big lawsuits winning. And if there are major damages awarded to some of the people who have been hurt by gender transition, that might break the industry, which has simply been able to profit off of injuring people and has not yet been held accountable for that. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Stay with us. Your Friday Faithful is coming up next. It's time now for your Friday Faithful. And today I want to leave you with this thought and this reminder. God is good and he causes all things to work together for your good. If it's not good, he's not done. The long and short of it is this. God is faithful and he won't fail. With that message, walk in faith today, trusting God to make it good. Well, that is going to do it for this edition of CBN Newswatch. Thank you so much for watching. I want to remind you, you can always find more of our news programs on the CBN News Channel. You can also find them online at any time. That is CBNNews.com. Take a moment. Let us know what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can email us. The address for that is Newswatch at CBN.com. And, of course, you can always reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We certainly would love to hear from you. Make this a fabulous Friday and then come on back and join us for another edition of CBN News Watch come Monday. Goodbye and God bless. Thank you for watching.